Welcome to the Confessions of an IT Business Owner podcast, where we believe that healthy cash flow is critical for your IT business, automation is paramount, and building trust with your clients by looking professional will help grow your business. I'm your host, Ryan Goodman, and today you'll learn about some profound struggles related to owning and growing an IT business and how Zach Kramer overcame them. We often say that we're trying to put out the biggest fire. So one of the things that we have to do as business owners is I have to decide with our limited resources, what's the priority right now? And if I spread myself too thin, then I know I'm not going to get anything done. I'm not gonna get 10% of a lot of things done. I'm going to get 0% of a lot of things done. Here's the podcast with Zach. Zach, thanks for joining us today on the Confessions of an IT Business Owners podcast. Appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to hang out with us here. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, you're it's good very, to be here. Yeah, very welcome. So let's just get some of the basics out of the way. Um, why don't you give the listeners your uh, your business name and where they can find you online? Okay. Uh, my business name is IT Assurance, and they can find us at itassurance.com. Cool, cool. Simple enough. So uh, we've kind of been having some banter back and forth before before we, we started recording here, and you talked to me a little bit about... Um, not, not so much an accountability group, but 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 kind of like a peer network um, for for business professionals, and uh, I think that really bodes to uh, sometimes it can be lonely as an entrepreneur, and would love to interject some of that conversation, you know, for for our listeners today as an entrepreneur, and to tee you up on that, um, you were talking about how when you became an entrepreneur. And you're getting together with friends and, and, you know, they're talking about work and having some complaints. You found yourself sitting on the other side of the table and saying, well, yeah. I kind of agree with your boss here. You're not you're not holding up your end of the deal, you know. And Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like someone's complaining that they're just a little bit late all the time. And why is their boss getting on them so much? And I'm kind of like, well, because that's inappropriate and because you need to be there at the time you say you're going to be there and you need to hold yourself to your commitments. And it's just like, who am I now? Yeah, you know, it's right, a right. completely different perspective. When did I get so responsible? Right, exactly. <laughs> and into holding other people accountable. Absolutely. Right? As, an, as a co-employee, often our, as a, as an employee, often all we're doing is defending our other coworkers to our boss, right? Sure. And so to suddenly be the boss, it's very different. Yeah, very much so. So when did you, uh, when did you make that turn from, from employee to, to business owner? Um, it was really early for me. I graduated college at uh, 23 and I had been working uh, part-time as an IT contractor. Okay. Um, and as a contractor, um, this was in the break fix days. Sure. I uh, saw that I kept 35% of the money and my boss got 65%. And I said, well, this is a sucker's bet, right? <laughs> this is terrible. And so uh, I said, I can do this better than this guy can. Um, and when I moved to Portland from Boston, uh, where I graduated from school, I said, I'm going to start an IT company. Yeah. And that was it. I put an ad on Craigslist. Um, Kramer Computer Repair. If I can't fix it, you don't pay me or something. That's that awesome. was literally the beginning. That's awesome. So do you still hold the same opinion, the 65-35 split and I'm not getting the fair end of the deal or, or have there been some things you've learned along the way that have changed that perspective a little bit? Um, yeah, there have been some things along the way that have changed that perspective. You know, uh, I didn't have the slightest idea that you could lose money as a business owner. Right. Right. As an employee, it always just looked like they made money. Um, I didn't understand the risks that I was signing up for. I didn't understand the liability that I was signing up for. Um, you know, I can have a key employee quit tomorrow, but that doesn't impact my customer. Right. They're still expecting me to provide the service that they paid for and put into that contract. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it's a yes. A many, many, many things I did not understand before I started the business. Right. 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 What uh, what kind of background outside of that that do you have? Did you did you go to school for technology or was this something that uh, um, was based on that work experience while in college? Um, so I have a degree in classical civilizations and ancient Greek from Boston University. Wow. Um, so yeah, that was that was highly relevant to the day to day operations. Yeah. Of a yeah. You just you provider. knocked it out of the park. Yeah, it's I picked the... it. I picked it right on. <laughs> um, no, I loved my degree. I loved my degree program. It was super fun. But yeah. what I really had was I just had tremendous arrogance. Right. I just thought that I could not based on anything. Right. Other than well, I'm smart and I was born to wealthy people. And I know what I'm doing, although I did not. 
right? But ultimately, the root of starting the business was I was too arrogant to understand how little I knew about it. Sure, sure. That's super interesting. Um, so beyond that, what are some of the lessons that uh, – do you, do you feel like – how do I say this the right way? Because I, and I feel like I can say, it. I've been humbled <laughs> before in my business yeah, many absolutely. times. Have, have there, was there a point where you're like, oh, wow, this, this is, uh, uh, this is a little bit different. Now I'm, now I'm on my heels and I'm not, and I'm not sure where to go next. Yeah. And, you know, bearing in mind that I've had this business now for 11 years. So the, the trajectory is long, right? So there are those moments of getting knocked on my butt in the very beginning, right? Yeah. Which are things like, um, you know, literally a losing money in the business, right? right? And not even being aware that's an option, right? right. I have contractors. How am I losing money? Right. <laughs> you know, how do I not, how am I not getting the good end of this deal? And then, you know, more recently with how tight the employment market has gotten, um, we had a two week period where we lost three entry level people. And that set us way back. That was a that was a real hardship. You know, we're a company of about fifteen, so losing three in a short time right. um, was very difficult for us. Yeah, that 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 is that is always tough. So, what are some of the things that you're doing to to solve those uh, talent issues and and the supply and demand issue with with people inside of the business? We have gotten really creative with that um, for a long time, and I'm in Portland, Oregon. Um, Portland was a tier two employment market. Uh, there weren't a lot of options for IT people, and an IT company job was a pretty good job. Um, what's happened over the last uh, three or four years is that many of the Silicon Valley companies and the Seattle companies have opened outposts in Portland. So, uh, you know, there's now Amazon offices here, Airbnb sure. offices, Puppet Labs, um, Urban Airship, all these companies, and they're bringing Silicon Valley money where they're hiring the people that I used to hire for. 15 or $16 an hour, so no, they're paying 23 or $24 an hour for. Yeah. Um, and so we've, we've definitely uh, seen that. Um, and at the same time, my customers aren't able to absorb that kind of price increase. Right. Um, so we have made some changes in the way that we hire. Um, we actually just a couple of weeks ago hired our first international employee. Nice. Um, we hired an engineer in Argentina okay. um, who is working for us remotely and doing a fantastic job. Um, we have started working with, uh, if I can name drop another IT related services company, yeah. um, GMS global mentoring, uh, solutions, cool. start taking our tier one calls, um, because they have people nationwide. And when I looked at what it was going to cost to have them take those calls, um, instead of me hiring tier one people who in Portland are now $20 an hour people, um, it was actually cost benefit analysis was there to, to actually outsource, um, that entry level call taking responsibility and tier one fixing. Um, and then we've also had to uh, take on an attitude of we are always hiring. It doesn't matter if we're full. It doesn't matter if everybody, if every bud is in every seat. Yeah. I know in three months, in four months, someone's probably leaving. Sure. So we've got to be ready at all times. So you're 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 creating a farm team at all times. Absolutely. We're, you know, we attend events and we put our name out there and we're running ads all the time. You know, even when we don't have a job available, we're running ads, taking in candidates, screening people, just kind of keeping the motor running on hiring. Yeah. No, that's smart. I mean, that's obviously a, a, a real, um, real direct approach as far as people talent to continue to make sure that, that, uh, um, you're staying relevant in the, on the employer side inside of the community, right? You're, you're, you're getting very visible from, from what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying for sure. Cool. So uh, what about automation? I mean, we've talked a lot about people, but I'm sure you've had to uh, not only um, use, I don't necessarily want to call it outsourcing, like contracted work, right? Scalable, mm -hmm. scalable resources, I guess, scalable human resources. Um, same thing with tools. I mean, is it a constant uh, evaluation of the tools that you have in the business that are going to help, you know, reduce human touch and, and human labor? Yeah, I mean, if this is supposed to be confessions of an IT business owner, that's a huge weakness of us organizationally. We have a lot of ideas, mm -hmm. right? But in terms of actual implementation of automation, uh, it's not a strength. It's sure. not something that we do particularly well. Sure. Um, we've gotten much better, uh, especially using IT Glue, at implementing policy and documentation so we can get the information we need when we need it, which does speed things up quite a bit. Right. Um, but the, I, I, know, I, I deeply admire some IT business owners I know that have people doing nothing but writing scripts and finding ways, you know, looking through tickets and finding ways to automate the common ones and the expensive ones. 
Um, and it's not something that we've ever uh, done particularly well. We're, we've always lagged a little bit in that area. Sure. No, that makes sense. Is it an area of, uh, of pursuit or is it kind of one of those, it doesn't fall inside of priority right now. There are, there are other fish to fry. Yeah. I mean, we, we often say that we're um, trying to put out the biggest fire, right? So one of the things that we have to do as business owners is I have to decide with our limited resources, what's the priority right now, Yeah. right? And if I spread myself too thin, then I know I'm not going to get anything done. I'm not going to get 10% of a lot of things done. I'm going to get 0% of a lot of things done. <laughs> right. Um, and so something I decided on uh, a few years back um, was that we're only going to change four things a year okay. as an organization. And so we set each quarter. This is what we're changing this quarter. We're, um, For example, this quarter we're uh, working on creating a template for the onboarding of an employee at each uh, client site. So not, not having it be generic, you know, for this client, here's exactly what they need, right? Um, and that's taking this quarter. We're spending time and effort on it, and it's already reducing um, go-backs on those tickets and, uh, you know, increasing client satisfaction scores on those tickets. So it's, it's working. But I know that I can't change too much in a year because you got to change the engines while the plane is flying. Right. Get it. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or bad things happen if you, if you take off the wings at the same time, right? Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, I get it. Uh, we follow something very similar type of methodology and in, in traction, right? Where you're always going to have stuff, but if you're not getting the big rocks done, um, you're not going to be able to ever get uh, anything done because you're focused on all the, the sand in a bottle. I think probably one of the best analogies was if you took a, a cup like this and you filled it with rocks and then you put in smaller stones and then you filled it with sand, dumped mm -hmm. it all out, then reverse, put the sand in, the little pebbles, the rocks don't fit anymore because right. it fit around everything. So you got to take care of the big, those big things first. And it sounds like that's exactly your approach. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the things that we've struggled with um, and continue to struggle with and have to always be keeping our eye on is a willingness to put in the resources, right? Yeah. It's always easy to pull resources. It's always easy for me to pull resources away from those long-term vision pieces and turn them to the customer that's screaming right now or the right. customer that's, that's, that's in pain right now. Right. And uh, one of the most difficult things that I do regularly is say, I understand this customer is upset, but you know what? We're in SLA. We're meeting the agreement. Sure. I'll talk to them about it, yeah. but we're not reallocating these resources because we're working towards something we've agreed is important as an organization. Sure. Have you ever had to make those uh, tough decisions where, you know, maybe a client that was a fit early on because of revenue needs didn't fit later on with, with how you were changing the trajectory of business operations? Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the most successful changes I ever made in the business, um, I got from a buddy of mine, I was eating uh, lunch with a friend who owned a web design company and we were kvetching and he uh, for those of you who aren't Jewish we were complaining to each other um, <laughs> we were uh, and uh, he was telling me about a change he'd made in his business which is uh, he owned this sort of general web design company take all comers build you a website five ten thousand dollars you know popcorn and they had done an exercise and realized that uh, their best customers were all credit unions and he had pivoted his entire business to only servicing credit unions right and he was making more money. He was happier. The business got smaller because that's now all they were doing. Sure. But actually more profitable. They were making more money, right? Higher EBITDA than uh, they were before, even with a smaller revenue line because they weren't having so many exceptions and weirdnesses. Um, and so I did a similar exercise with my team probably four or five years ago now where we took a big whiteboard and we wrote down the names of every single customer that we had, right? And we scored all of them, A, B, and C. Right. And what we saw is that in the C column was the lawyers, the doctors, right, the CPAs, that type of client. Great for some companies. I know some companies that do nothing but specialize in that type. Right. Yeah. But terrible for us. We didn't like working with them. They didn't like working with us. Right. Not a good use of resources. Yeah. And over in the A column, we saw we had everyone who made something right? Manufacturers, distribution facilities, uh, prototyping labs, CNC operators, the people who made stuff, those were all of our A clients. We liked working with them the most and they liked working with us the most, right? And so we pivoted the entire business and said, we're the IT company for people who make things. That's awesome. Right? And that changed the sales pitch so much because it went from being, well, we're kind of like everybody else, but a little different, I guess, you know, to like, 
you're a manufacturer, great. That's what we do. We understand ERP and EDI, and we understand awesome. your technologies. And the other guys you're talking to, they don't. Right. And you're and, talking you their know, language. Exactly. They recognize it in the sales and the questions you're asking, I'm sure. I'm sure. Right. It. Yeah. And we changed our pricing model to make sense to manufacturing. I mean, sure. we didn't change the, you know, we get about the same MRR, but yeah. we divided it up differently based on the way they employ people. Sure. You know, a per person price doesn't work in an environment where you might have 100 people who are on the floor. Yeah. Right. So things like that where they can see, oh, these guys understand how our type of business works. Yeah. They're not fitting in a box. I mean, that's a that's a really good scenario. Um, not charging per seat because they technically might not all be using the technology that you'd be supporting at any given time, right? Right, exactly. Gotcha. We need to find the right way to charge for this yeah, type yeah. of environment, which is different than a CPA's office. Cool. That's that's really interesting. Hey guys, Ryan Goodman here, president at Connect Booster and your host for this fine podcast. We want to take a quick break from our episode and thank you for listening. We wouldn't do this if it weren't for you, so thank you for sticking with us on this adventure. We also want to thank Zach for joining us on today's episode. You can find out more about Zach in IT Assurance at itassurance.com. Zach has given us a lot of fantastic information about his struggles and successes with owning an IT business, and there's a lot more coming after this break. If you want to learn more about IT Assurance and their services, give them a call, send them an email, throw a carrier pigeon if you have to, they want to help you out. Before we get back to the episode, we want to let you know all the ways that you can find us online, starting with connectbooster.com slash podcast. That's where all of our new episodes go up first, so if you want to listen right away, check out connectbooster.com slash podcast and sign up for our podcast email list. Episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, and Google as well. So subscribe to our channel or find us on your favorite podcast platform and they'll let you know when new episodes are ready to listen to. If you want to connect with us or be a guest on the podcast, email us at podcast at connectbooster.com or send us a message on Facebook or Twitter and we'll be sure to point you in the right direction. Lastly, if you like the podcast, tweet about it using the hashtag ITConfessions. We don't pay to promote the show, so sharing it is the best way to let us know how you like it. Thanks again for listening to the Confessions of an IT Business Owner. We'll get back to the podcast and talk to you soon. Um, I'm going to shift gears on you a little bit. Yeah. Um, anything that you are uh, reading currently, or if not, what's the last... Uh, What's the last most uh, influential book that, that you've read? Uh, the most influential, the most recent influential book that I read was Rising Strong uh, by Brene Brown. Rising um, Strong. B-R-E-N-E-B-R-O-W-N. And she is, as far as I know, the world's foremost shame researcher. Okay. And uh, she really dives deep into uh, shame and why we feel the way that we feel um, and what we can do about it. Um, and I read that book on a, I take sort of a, a vision quest is too strong of a word, but I'll take three to five days, uh, a couple of times a year, turn my phone off, turn my email off, go somewhere yeah. right, with books and my journals and just be alone, right? Completely by myself. And I'll read and I'll journal. I'll think about the company and my life and what's next. What do I want to do? Um, I read that book on my last one of these journeys and I reacted so strongly to one part of the book that I physically threw it out of my hands <laughs> left the hotel room that i was in in my socks without the key <laughs> and it wasn't until the door closed that i even realized i had like run out of the room <laughs> um so it was a powerful book yeah no doubt so uh, how is that how is that affected how has that affected your business were there any changes that came from from that that last uh experience i would say it's it's uh Yes, but it's a continuation of what we've been doing. Sure. Um, so I'm always learning how to be a better leader, right? So I wouldn't say there was anything that came from that book that was a 180 shift that was, oh my God, we're going to totally change the way we're doing it. But it was, here's a better way. Here's how I can get where I'm trying to go faster, sure. right? Here's something I didn't understand about myself. And now that I do understand it, I can understand my actions better and my reactions better. And I can perform better in the situations that I'm coming across. Um, so 
Yeah, I don't know if that's an answer. I'm sorry. That's No, that's a really good answer, that. actually. Um, and let me see if I'm reading this right between the lines. Was was there a lot in that book about how you relate to people and oh, how sure, you yeah. react to situations? Um, which, I mean, any of us that are em- employers, um, we deal with any any number of barrage of things, whether, you know, it's, and it's not just technical problems, right? A lot of times it's just, it's how do you deal with the situation or maybe someone's frustrated and, and how do you handle that? And, and that can set the whole tone of the day based on yeah. something happening, you know, and, and we have so much power as, as business leaders to set the tone on any given day. Um, am I hitting the mark there or am I like yeah, off in left yeah. field? No, you're, you're in, you're definitely in the ballpark. Um, you know, we get to, I get to choose how I'm going to react to the things that happen to me, right? The things are going to happen no matter what. Exactly. But the extent to which I choose to own them, right? Sure. The extent to which I choose to get mad about them or what I do with the mad that I feel, right? Because, you know, one of the, one of the biggest lies that I hear in business owner advice is, oh, it's just business, right? There's no emotions in business. There are tons of emotions Lots in business emotions. constantly. And so when I hear people say that, oh, it's just business, I'm like, that's not true. Right. Right. You're having emotions. You're having feelings. You just don't want to talk about them. Right. And that's OK. But for me, I have these feelings and I have emotions and I acknowledge them and I do want to talk about them. But I want to talk about them in a healthy way yeah. that helps my business achieve its goals versus, you know, yelling at people. Well, and that's I mean, that's emotional intelligence, right? I mean, that's that's the basis of it. Tactical empathy, I've also heard it called. Even there, you put the word tactical on it, right? And it's like, and this is this is a pet peeve of mine, but when people militarize for-profit companies, sure. right? I just hate it. Sure. You know, they're like, oh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, put the battalion in place to slaughter the opponents <laughs> to, you know, take care of business. And it's gonna, we're going to gun down all of our sales leads. And I'm just like, what? Slow <laughs> like you down. A, yeah, you sit in an air-conditioned office, Chad. Yeah. Like, slow your roll a little bit. Zach, um, do you have any bullets flying over your head today? Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> that's. It's just not, and it's not relevant, right? I mean, what the military does and what a business does are not relevant, and they're just not that related. I think I've coined a new phrase: strategic empathy. Sure, strategic <laughs> empathy. So a, a little bit of a shift again here in, yeah. in the podcast. Um, if you were able to talk to your younger self, you know, you talked about being in the business for, for 11 years and you could give yourself some advice today to that younger self. What are some of the things that you would, you would say? Hmm. Well, until about the age of 25, I wouldn't have listened to anything that I would have said. Sure. Right. I talked about arrogance earlier. Right. Sure. And I'm, I'm 35 today and I've gone on quite a journey of discovery of myself um, in that way. Um, but uh, just assuming a world right in which the younger version of myself would listen to anything. Right. And absorb what that thing is. <laughs> um, the, the biggest thing uh, that I would that I would say is uh, it's OK to go it alone. It's OK to be the only one doing what you're doing. If you are firm in your conviction, if you believe that what you're doing is right, then that's okay. And sometimes you're going to look behind you and you're not going to see anybody. And that doesn't mean that you're wrong, right? And um, uh, where this comes up a lot for me is uh, I used to have an IT company that was exclusively white male employees, right? And if you had asked me, well, Zach, why are all your employees white men? I would have said, that's who's interested, right? I put an ad out into the world. That's who replies. There's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with my industry. It's just who's interested in IT, right? And then, you know, I looked at that and I, I said, I don't buy that, right? And I started looking into like the history of computers. So um, do you like your keyboard? Absolutely. Do you know who invented the keyboard? I do who invented not. the idea of a keyboard connecting to a computer to input data? No idea. A woman named Pam England. That's cool. Right? She invented that. Do you know who invented SDP? I do right? not. The internet, the internet transfer protocol, right? The yeah. ability of our computers to trade data with each other in a lossless and fast fashion, right? I don't remember her name, but that was a woman, right? Do you know who ran the Enigma machines? Women. We have written women out of the history of IT. And so I started to look at that and say, oh, it's not that women aren't interested. It's that we're not attracting them in the right way. Sure. Right. And so we looked at the way we hire, we looked at the way we train, we looked at everything and we made big, big changes. Right. And today I have a company that is uh, a majority minority company. 
right? Most of my employees are women or people of color, right? Cool. The white men are now a minority within the organization. Sure. And there's nothing magic about that except that I looked at the situation and said, I don't care that no one else's IT company looks like this. This is wrong. I'm not okay with this. And I'm going to do something about it. And I did. That's cool. And that's, that's, was that a result of, um, you know, some of that time that you take annually and a reflection on your business or did that, or did that really, um, hit you in a, in a different way? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, a number of things came together for that. Um, one is I have been bullied in my life. I am a, 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 an odd duck, right? And so I've always had um, an edge for the underdog. Yeah. Um, and as my business became more profitable and larger and I went to more events and talked to more people and I, I'm a curious person. So I would ask the questions of these people who were almost exclusively white male owners of it businesses. Mm -hmm. And the answers I got just kept reading false. I just kept saying that's a comfortable answer, but it's not true. I don't really buy it. Right. And so for me, that leads to research. And that leads to investigation. Sure. And so by doing that research and that investigation, it leads to actual data. And I can say, you know what? It's not true that women aren't interested in computers. What we need to do as an industry is we need to acknowledge that we drive women out of the industry, right? That sexual harassment in the industry is rampant, right? That the experiences of women at conferences, at events, in IT companies are often terrible. The experiences of people of color at conferences in, in the industry and their jobs are often terrible. And that's something that we need to address as opposed to just being something that we go, eh, all right. Oh, this is cool. This is a really neat, uh, neat way to have even a little bit more of a public conversation around, you know, some of the ways that you run your business and, and, um, you know, based on your research, some of the things that, that you're, you're finding, you know, based on not only personal experience, but I'm sure as you're uncovering, as you're, as you're doing more research as well. Right. And, you know, and I even look at this podcast. Right. So 13 guests so far. Yeah. Right. What have been the demographics of the guests? Oh, gosh. Um, it will be predominantly white male. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And so representation matters. Right. And I get that I'm a white male on your podcast right now. Right. Sure. I'm as much a part of the problem as anybody else. Sure. But, um, you know, I definitely look at representation and I, I, uh, I, I work on this stuff. So do you remember, um, were you, are you familiar with IT Glue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they had a convention a year ago. Uh, glue X, right? Uh, I, I, glue con was the glue con. Glue X was the yeah, second yeah, one. Yeah. Gotcha. So for glue con, their roster of speakers was 21 men, right? 21 men of which, of whom 20 were white. Right. And I protested that and I got together some friends from the industry and we sent letters and we posted on LinkedIn and I called every single presenter myself and said, do you know that this is what this looks like? Right. And we were able to bring about a little bit of change in that event. Not a lot of change in that event, but we brought about a little bit of change in that event. And then when Glue X happened, the next year's event, sure enough, all of a sudden there was a diverse slate of speakers. Right. And I think that I uh, played a role in making that change happen. And so that's uh, something that I'm, that I'm quite proud of. And I'm, I'm working on it now with um, Pax8, you know, Pax8, right? The yep. Yep. Distributor. distributor yeah. So they're doing Wingman Conference. Sure. Right. Um, they released a slate of speakers, six white men. And I've been in conversation with them. They say they do have some diversity coming. They just don't have it on the website yet. You know, they have some some other people coming. But same thing. You know, it's um, it's something that I saw that was that I thought was wrong, right? And that uh, therefore I decided I was going to spend time and energy to address. Well, it's cool that uh, that we live in a place that that you know, no matter what side of that line you fall on, we have the ability to have that dialogue and also take action whether it's in our business and, and uh, um, be able to be able to voice our opinion, which I think is super, super important. I mean, God, can you imagine being in a place where we don't? That's a terrifying prospect, man. Um, not only from a social standpoint, but even just the opportunity that we get to be entrepreneurs and, 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 and have some control over, over destiny. Yes, absolutely. And that's, you know, and that's the great thing that I understand that I got, right? My advantage grow, uh, starting a business as a white man with means, right, is that I did get to decide my destiny, Sure. right? And then when I talk to young women in IT and I talk to people of color and I just hear how they're treated, right, the derision and the dismissiveness and the harassment, I think I want everyone to have the opportunity, 
right? That's supposed to be the American dream is that everyone has an equal opportunity. And instead, when I started to look around and actually talk to people and hear their stories, what I saw is that I had that opportunity because of who I am and what I look like, sure. right? And what I sound like, but not everybody's getting that opportunity. And uh, that just, man, it just makes me mad. It's something I feel pretty strongly about. Well, it's cool. It's relevant and, and it's relevant to you. And I think it's a, a topic that's certainly worthy of discussion. Um, question for you. You've mentioned yeah. a couple of times, you know, you grew up and, and things were, you, you, you were well off. Um, yeah. do you feel like that was, uh, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages, I guess, of being an individual in that, in that position? Because I think there are a lot of times people would think, well, that's flowery, that's easy. Things are set up, but I'm sure it had its set of challenges as well that you, that you had to overcome being in that position. Yes. But let's also be frank about how much easier it is, right? Sure. Starting with a bank. Loan. Money, money solves a lot right? of problems. Anyone that says it doesn't um, is just not being truthful. Absolutely. And yeah. it's, it's important to me to say that, and I'm proud to say it out loud, because when I meet other business owners and they are struggling or they are not as successful, and I, I do a lot of business mentoring, sure. you know, sometimes they look at me and they say, well, how did you achieve your success? You know, you've done well. How did you do so well? And it would be dishonest for me not to acknowledge what well, part of the way that I did well is when my business was failing, right? When my business should have ended, mm -hmm. right? By the market's decision, yeah. I got a loan from my parents. Sure. Right. right? And yeah. I kept the business floating. Yeah. Right. Very few people in this world have access to an immediate low interest, non-collateralized line of credit. Right. Right. For, from an email. Right. Um, I was at a, I was at an event recently uh, and we were, we were uh, listening to a speaker and she said, um, uh, raise your hand. It was an event of business owners. Raise your hand if you were born in poverty, right? And in this room of about 100 business owners, I think three hands went up, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, being born wealthy or being born with means absolutely makes it easier to start and run a business. So right. uh, were there some challenges? Yes. But man, it's way more of a benefit. Sure. It's way, way better than it is, than it is a problem. Sure. Um, I would say the biggest place where it was a problem goes back to that arrogance. Um, I was raised being uh, treated well and deferred to, and you know there were people, and, and just to be clear, like I'm not a Rockefeller, right? We didn't right, know right, or right, like that. But it was we. I grew up, well, uh, you know, well off, yeah. and um, so I didn't understand how to treat people, right? Sure. I didn't understand how to have employees. I didn't understand the the give and take of a normal relationship almost. Sure. Um, so I had to learn, I learned a lot of social skills. I learned a lot about how to interact with people and how to engage with people and, and how to uh, be an empathetic, caring, connected person. Sure. So you're, you're obviously a, a child of your parents. Do you have any kids yourself? I know that's a personal question. So <laughs> uh, no, I don't have any kids. Okay. Okay. I have a little orange tabby kitten. Yeah. His name is Mittens. I will send you pictures so you can put him on this, uh, uh, so you can put him on the face of this blog or something like that. Yeah. I love my kid like nobody's business. What are, what are some of the things I have, I have two, uh, I have two boys, you know, um, and one of the things that I, I, you know, concerned about, I'm able to give them things that I was never able to have, you know, and how do you, how do you draw that line where, um, and I haven't figured this out yet. Um, I'm, I work real hard, but you know, making sure that they, uh, understand the the value of of hard work and and the position that they're in you know yeah uh, that's a great and, question and being able to being able to uh appreciate that well at the same time i think it's uh, it's really important to um um give back and and be mindful you know and and help others that have that that same type of desire that want to um build something cool build something great or make an impact yeah that's, that's a hard question, and I'm glad I don't have kids, so I don't have to answer it. And I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it's a challenge for you and for many people. And I know it was yeah. a challenge that, for my parents, right? right? They've talked to me about, and I've talked to them about the struggle that they had because neither of them grew up uh, as people of means, sure. right? And so they had, were always trying to balance between they want the best for their children. They want the private schools, and they want the tutoring and the education. Right. But they also don't want them to grow up being jerks, sure. right? And sure. how to manage that as a parent sounds hard. Yeah. I mean, parenting as a whole sounds quite difficult. Right, right, right. Well, hey, you, you've, you've come to that place where you've, you've kind of realized both sides of that equation yourself. It's, it's cool to, to, to listen and talk through uh, um, your perspective on that, which I think is, well, is really interesting for, for people to hear. Um, yeah. 
So as as we're wrapping up here, what what's uh you seem like you're a guy that that is really looking for ways to um leave a conversation, leave a business, leave a leave a a, a social engagement um better than how you encountered it. What are what are some of the ways that you ensure that you do that? Um one of the big things that I had to do for myself was I had to uh, have a tattoo removed, right? Interesting. Um, starting a business, I had a tattoo. It was not a real tattoo, but it's a business tattoo that I think basically every business owner has. And that tattoo says the way to happiness is growth, right? The way to success is bigger, is more, right? When you have a uh, 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 $100,000 in revenue, go get two hundred and fifty. When you have two hundred and fifty, go get a million. When you have a million, go get five million. When you have five million, more, 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 more. What's the end? And yeah. there came a day when uh, the year ended and I had made, um, we had about a $2 million top line, yep. right? It was the biggest that we had ever been in that we, or that we would ever be. Um, we had a very small NOI. It was 2%, 3%. I mean, it was gnarly. It was very little. Yeah. And I was really unhappy, right? I wasn't enjoying owning the company and I hadn't been happy for a long time. Um, and throughout the long time, I had grown the company from a million to two million. Yeah. And so finally, something happened to two million. I think it took about three years between one million and two million in revenue. And when I got to two million, and I saw that two at the beginning of it, and instead of feeling thrilled or excited or anything, I just felt empty and sad. Hmm. Right. Uh, that was a big wake up for me. Of you know what, this tattoo I'm, I, I have on my arm that says the only way to happiness and success is to grow. I'm taking this off. This is stupid. This doesn't work for me. Sure. Um, and we stopped growing about four years ago. Okay. Uh, where we, we, we dropped down to about a million and a half dollar company, which is about where we've been for, for the last four years. But we do it with, I do it with people that I love working with. I only, we have a, we have a rule, you might want to bleep this later, which is no asshole clients, right? <laughs> That's cool. And we just, we won't take people on just for the money. Yeah. And we won't keep them just for the money. And we still lose clients and bring on clients, but we stay right around that million and a half dollar mark yeah. um, by just keeping to an ethic of we want to work with people we like, we want to employ people that we like, and we want to have a good time. In fact, can I, can I tell you something we do in our company that people often like yeah, a lot? I would love to. So love once to a month, we have a meeting, and the meeting is called the Good News Meeting. Yeah. Okay. And it's an hour during which we all get together as a company, and all we talk about is good news. That's it. Personal That's good cool. news, business good news, nothing but good news, right? And every month I'll do some sort of a good news challenge. Um, so for this month, I gave every employee $50 and I said, go do good with this $50, That's right? Awesome. And come back next month and tell us about the good that you did, right? Or it might be this month, um, the company's going to buy lunch for you and a coworker. Go, go have lunch with a coworker you don't spend much time with, That's cool, right? And come back and tell us why they're so awesome. Yeah. And every single month we have the good news meeting and it's, I don't know what the business value is. There's no, I don't know what the ROI is. I can't tell you about its impact on the gross profitability or anything else. But what I can tell you is everybody leaves the meeting feeling good. That's cool. Well, awesome. That's what I want. Well, and good on you. I mean, you're creating an, a business environment that's fulfilling for you. You're, you're surrounding yourself with staff that are uh, fulfilled by being in that environment. And I mean, talk about a dream for an entrepreneur. I mean, that's, that's yeah. awesome. Good on you. Yeah. Man. Good on Thank you. you. Well, Zach, this has been a this has been really great. I, I'll tell you what the thing I love about getting together with entrepreneurs and talking through their business. You never know the direction it's going to go. And I'll tell you what this has been one of the most content rich episodes that we've ever had. So I I, I really do uh, appreciate the insights and and letting us into your business, let us letting us into your mind. And this was uh, this was a lot of fun. This was this was time really well spent. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I really appreciate your time and I appreciate you having me on and uh, being open to talking about some of these topics that are, you know, uh, they're important to business, but are a little different than some of what uh, what usually gets talked about. And I appreciate you giving me a platform for that. And I'll say to anybody who's listening, who's interested in how to be more effective at hiring and training um, uh, uh, minority and women employees, email me, Zach, Z-A-C at ITAssurance.com. And I'm happy to share tips and tricks and to talk to you about the journey that I've been on and how we can make our industry an inclusive one uh, where everybody feels welcome. Welcome. Cool, Zach. Love that. Great way to uh, great way to send off the time together. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ryan. I appreciate you having me. You bet, man. Mm-hmm.